Hi everyone, I am Devor Najjar and I'm very excited to get you present today uh, a project that I've worked on uh, during the last part of my PhD uh, and it's titled the lab on a chip for the concurrent electrochemical detection of SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acids and anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in saliva. Uh, this project was a huge collaboration um, and it was mostly between uh, members of the Wies Institute. So uh, I was working on my PhD with Professor Jim Collins and we're a few benches away from the Ingber lab led by Don Ingber uh, at the Wies Institute. And so this was a collaboration between myself and Elena from the Collins lab, as well as Pawan and Sanjay from the Ingber lab, as well as Josh, who was visiting in the Ingber lab. But the uh, number of people who were involved span researchers, uh, staff engineers, uh, clinicians who gave us access to some of the really cl critical blood samples and serum samples that we needed uh, to validate this platform, uh, as well as the mentors that we've had. And um, I myself have just completed my PhD, as I said, uh, between the Beast Institute as well as the MIT Media Lab where I was co-advised by Jim Collins and Professor Joe Paradiso. Uh, and my main interest has always been in sensing and sensing in particular is quite interesting. We have a lot of sensors that are dressed on our body, of course, um, but those sensors only work within a certain regime. And one of the main interests of science has always been, how do we create um, sensors that can augment the sensors that we have on our body and make our sensing abilities um, at different resolutions. So things that can be really, really small, things that are really far away. So we've created a lot of um, methods of being able to interrogate the world around us um, by proxy methods that are going beyond our sensing. And um, in particular for biology, we in the past you know, 200 or so years have really excelled at our ability to be able to sense particularly really, really tiny things. Um, and we've created a lot of methods that would allow us through direct and indirect methods to sense things like uh, proteins and nucleic acids, which control uh, our bodies and a lot of the world that we interact with. And so uh, the, the main methods, for instance, that we use specifically for SARS-CoV-2 detection. So this talk will be about um, COVID detection, but it, there's also a lot of broader implications for how we can use this method for any type of nucleic acid sensing. I know that the title of the presentation didn't have CRISPR in it, and this is a CRISPR conference, um, but we use CRISPR as the way of doing nucleic acid detection, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, so the main ways that we have been able to de detect nucleic acids in particular, uh, and also just proxies for microbes and pathogens that we're interested in. So PCRs obviously are uh, indirectly or directly um, detecting um, DNA or RNA. So in the case of DNA, it's drug detection. In the case of RNA, we have cDNA that would allow us to, de to detect the RNA. Um, antigen assays are typically um, indirect assays. So we're looking for things like uh, proteins and um, things that are produced by the uh, pathogen of interest, not the pathogen itself, but what it's what it's producing uh, and sequencing, which is also a nucleic acid detection method, but gives us a lot more granularity than you can get with PCR antigen into um, the exact differences of um, different microbes in it and um, pathogens. And in particular, trying to do a lot of like lineage detection and understanding the evolution of those uh, pathogens and microbes. And there are a lot of, um, you know, pros and cons to these three methods. They are methods that um, all of us, I think, have been exposed to at previous points in our life if you're somebody who's been working in a laboratory on biological um, assays. But, you know, over the past two and a half years, there are now household names that people in your family probably um, know and think about, even if they have never had exposure to the lab. And um, I think for PCR, of course, this is sort of the gold standard method. PCR and qPCR that we use. And the pros are that it's really easy to design a PCR assay. As long as you have the sequence of the thing you're looking for, uh, it's quite simple to try and produce um, a set of primers that you can use to detect. Um, and it's quite sensitive and quite specific. So it's really important, especially when you're trying to do things um, that, let's say it's a larger family and you wanna look at a very specific piece within that family, um, you're able to use PCR. 
But the cons are that um, there's a long turnaround for results. So most people don't have PCR machines inside of their homes, which means that you're going to have to be sending this out into a lab facility to get processing and get the results. Um, and that then requires a centralized facility, which when you have something that is um, such a bottleneck experience, like let's say a COVID spike in your region, it could take upwards of a week or more in order to get the results that you really need as soon as possible. Um, and also PCR is quite ex expensive. So as far as methodologies go, usually um, facilities will be using spin kits and purification methods um, for the sample that they're taking from you and then running the PCR uh, on very expensive equipment. So it's not necessarily the most affordable option. Um, antigen assays, on the other hand, um, you know, it takes a while to produce them. So one of the cons is that there's a long design process um, in order to create an antigen assay that you could use in your home. It could take months of iteration. So for instance, it took until about December 2020 for there to be a, the first CDC assay um, that was approved um, or FDA approved assay for it under the EUA so that we can um, test for uh, SARS-CoV-2 within our own homes. Um, and there's like less accuracy that's available. So it's very possible you could be infected with a um, pathogen, but because your body hasn't developed a high enough amount of whatever antigen that, whatever the antigen assay is looking for, you won't actually test positive. Um, but they are affordable and, and pretty quick for turnaround to result and easy to use, which means that they're great to disseminate to a large population with the understanding that they are less sensitive than alternative methods. And then there's sequencing, which um, is an interesting addition to this um, set of monitoring methodologies because it is the most new of all of the methods. So next generation sequencing has really only been around and robust for the past 10 to 20 years. And um, it's expensive. And also I think what's frustrating is that it produces a very large volume of data, which requires a lot of uh, technical skill in order to um, untangle and start to read, which means it's very much not meant for a layperson. Um, but it does um, not require you to know much about the sequence necessarily. So when you're in very early stages of trying to monitor things, uh, it can be really helpful. Um, and also it can monitor down to single nucleotide differences, which means that not only are you looking at, you know, let's say a large scale um, uh, pathogen of interest, but you're at, you can actually go down and see, um, you know, SNP level detection, you can do um, strain differentiation and do more lineage, as I was saying before, and it's quite robust, so it can take a lot, but it's just quite expensive. Um, and so for me as a researcher, um, and also just as a person who was experiencing the pandemic, I was quite frustrated that these were the only options that were available, especially, um, you know, as somebody who was stuck in my home for a large portion of things. Um, I was frustrated with the options that my family had access to and my friends. And I felt that science, you know, especially within the laboratory had progressed to such a large extent, but I realized that that hadn't been reflected in what was available and accessible on a market, especially um, given, you know, how much progress we've made in the field over the past 10 to 20 years. Um, and fortunately I had been working with a, um, a system that I felt was actually quite uh, well, um, suited for trying to figure out how we can do better at-home detection um, and that uses as you might imagine um, CRISPR. So CRISPR is a family of enzymes you've been hearing a lot about it if you're at this conference uh, and the enzyme that I'm particularly fond of is called Cas12a um, and it's an enzyme that does uh, double-stranded cutting, um, staggered double-stranded cutting of um dna and all you really need like most crispr enzymes is the crispr enzyme and the guide rna which will lead you to the target um and cas12a is a special enzyme that has this off target um property that was discovered which is that once it finds its uh target strand and it cuts it has this extra feature which is that it also starts uh, cleaving all the single-stranded DNA that's in the vicinity of the enzyme. So once the enzyme is sort of activated, uh, when it does the initial cleavage of the intended target, it sort of looks around and any type of single-stranded DNA that's in the vicinity of it, it will start collaterally cleaving that single-stranded DNA. Um, and there were researchers in the, um, in Feng Zhang's lab as well as in the Daimler lab who concurrently published um, systems which use Cas12 as a method of doing um, nucleic acid detection in a very rapid manner and so um, the way they did this was by adding cas12a with a guide for their target of interest 
um, as well as the DNA that they're trying to look to cleave and a um, fluorescent um, molecule, which was tied through a single-stranded DNA short um, bridge to a quencher, which means that when the um, Cas12a is not activated and it is not in the presence of its target, it will not fluoresce. But once the Cas12a is exposed to its target, uh, it will start collaterally cleaving the single-stranded DNA bridge between the uh, fluorescent quencher and the fluorescence molecule, which means that you get a fluorescence which indicates the presence of the nucleic acid of interest within your reaction, which is wonderful because this means that we can then do, um, we can try and create a tool which can combine some of the best features of the uh, methods that I had just previously listed, which means we can create assays that you can use at home that are relatively quick, quick where you can hopefully get an answer, maybe not within 15 minutes, but within somewhere like an hour. Um, you can get really high sensitivity and a rapid design process to create the primers that you would need to do the amplification and detection of the um, um, of the pathogen of interest or the uh, DNA of interest. And you also, and you, well, sorry, also you can use it for um, RNA. So you can just use your risk transcription. So any nucleic acid of interest, DNA or RNA, you can use. Um, and you can also get SNP level sensitivity. So if you've all listen to the my sherlock talk which is also available in this conference um there uh my collaborator elena and i we showed that you can get snip level sensitivity um to do strain uh, detection of sars cov2 which was really exciting so you can combine a lot of the really useful um key techniques from the most common methods that have been used for detection um all in one system and i think that that means that you can create um a system that can generate data that's maybe not as good as, let's say, high quality quantitative data that you can get from a qPCR machine or a sequencing machine, but it's enough data that you have in your own home in a very quick turnaround time that can allow you to make really important decisions on how you go about your life. Um, and so, you know, taking us back to the pandemic, um, you're in your home and you're thinking about what are my options? And your options at home are usually uh, antigen tests. Your options for leaving the home are something like a centralized PCR assay. Um, and in both cases, you're not getting a lot of information, right? Because you're just checking what your disease state is at the moment. And I think one of the most interesting things about the COVID pandemic was that it introduced us to the idea that it's not only important to know whether or not you're actively infected with a pathogen, but it's also really useful and important to know um, the antibodies that your body has produced against that pathogen and what that antibody signal looks like over the course of time. So this was one of the first times where people cared not only about infection, but also about post-infection experience with um, a, a pathogen. And with both of the methods that we have currently, it gives you this very, very short window of time, um, which is just really when the virus is active in your body to know what's going on. So for instance, um, when your body is producing um, you know, let's say signals, you only have about five to 10 days where you're going to have the presence of the virus inside of your body. There are some people obviously who have experienced um, the presence of the virus in their body a lot longer than that, but those are hopefully few and far between. So for the most part, if you're infected with SARS-CoV-2, within the first five to 10 days of infection is when you're actually going to have uh, the virus actively replicating inside of your body. And past that, you have this huge signal of all of the seroconversion that your body's going through as your body's producing different anti antibodies against that virus. And those antibody signals are also just as important in understanding somebody's complete disease state. And so um, not only were we interested in producing a tool that can try and help us detect whether somebody is actively infected with SARS-CoV-2, but we were also interested in thinking about how can we widen this window? Can we design a biosensor that can simultaneously provide nucleic acid and antibody information, which was something that we weren't seeing available. So often when people wanted to get tested, it was for one or the other. So they were either getting tested um, to see whether or not they had antibodies post-infection and what the levels of those antibodies looked like to understand whether they had long lasting protection against the virus or they were looking to see am I actively infected. And there was no multiplex biosensor that was available that can give you a much larger picture of what the disease state you had looked like. And we felt this was an area that um, could really use innovation. Um, and so we designed this system. I'm referring to it as um, Melody, but it's a multiplex electrochemical um, detection um, system. And 
we just recently published on it in Nature Biomedical Engineering. Um, and the basis of the system is off of this chip. So this is an eRapid chip, which was previously developed um, by researchers in Don Ingber's lab. And it has this really unique um, system that allows for um, reduction of fouling on the surface of the electrochemical sensor. So electrochemical sensors have been around for a while, but the difficulty has been to get a signal that's sensitive enough to, to provide clinical level um, results for the assay. And the goal was for this chip to create a biofouling, an anti-biofouling surface that can allow, allow you to read down to very, very, very um, small quantities without having to deal with the biofouling you usually get. Um, with biological samples. And they've created uh, a suite of, of different types of coatings and a lot of them um, use uh, charged materials that are flowing through this BSA uh, glutaraldehyde system. And the one that we were using um, for our particular um, assay was using reduced graphene oxide as the um, charged material, but you can also use things like you know, gold and, and gold nanowires and carbon nanotubes as ways of also sensing, but the reduced graphene oxide glutaraldehyde BSA coating was uh, the one that we chose for our system. It works extremely sensitively, which is previously published on. And so we teamed up with the Ingber lab um, and they had been previously working on a very standard sandwich type ELISA assay to try and do antibody detection for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the beauty of this system was that we really knew um, how we obviously innovated a lot, but um, the researchers in their lab spent a lot of time trying to choose the correct antigens that they were displaying on this um, e-rapid chip to make sure that we were doing very sensitive primary antibody um, selection. And the way that we were doing that was through the sandwich assay where there was a TMB precipitate, which created a charge difference. Um, inside the system. So if the antibody you were trying to detect was present, there would be um, an HRP, a poly HRP that was recruited to the secondary antibody, which would cause the TMB precipitation, which causes a spike in the um, um, the electrochemical uh, current that is running through. So when you get that difference, um, you get it to the peak, which is really what we're looking for. And they had already created a multiplex um, electrochemical um, chip that looked not only at um, the most common um, antibodies, but actually at a suite of different antibodies. Um, and that was interesting to us because again, when you're thinking about the disease state, when you're thinking about overall um, for different people, depending on your infection, you have a different response. And so for let's say people that were never infected from SARS-CoV-2, but got the vaccine, you would have a signal for the spike protein, but you wouldn't have a signal for the nucleocapsid protein because you were never exposed to the virus. Somebody who's exposed to the virus um, would have both nucleocapsid um, spike and receptor binding domain. Um, receptor binding domain is a subsection of the spike protein, but that's the place that has been seen to be most hypermutated. And so that is also an ability for us to determine, let's say for future strains, um, does this person have protective antibodies against the receptor binding domain of a future strain um, of SARS-CoV-2? And that gives you a better sense of whether or not people are well adapted and have enough anti antibodies that are able to protect against the virus. So already this was a really exciting system. Um, there was very strong signals that were um, correlated with the detection of different um, antibodies that we were interested in. And we actually saw that our system um, for the antibody section was working even better than um, traditional ELISAs with the blood and serum samples that we were, um, I'm sorry, for the serum samples that we were using. And we tested about 100 different um, samples, 50 or so positive and 50 or so negative for um, COVID. So that was really reassuring was that we had, when you use the multiplex chip, you had 100% um, sensitivity and selectivity for determining whether this patient was infected with SARS-CoV-2 or not. And the goal for this was to figure out how we can combine this ERAP and antibody sensing system with um, the Sherlock system of being able to detect very rapidly uh, nucleic acids. And so the typical Sherlock system, the typical um, detection system, it's based most commonly using fluorescence reporter. And we wanted to figure out, can we modify the typical CRISPR assay to create an electrochemical CRISPR system that can give you clinical level sensitivity. So people have published previously on methods of doing this, but they weren't down to um, 
let's say the one copy per microliter or a thousand copies per milliliter sensitivity that we were looking for that would match um, the gold standard assays that we were trying to come up against. Um, and we were able to create an, a new assay, um, a CRISPR-based electrochemical assay that was custom made for this um, e-rapid chip. And we actually also produced a, a microfluidic system that allowed us to autonomously run this assay to make sure that um, we can have as few user interactions as possible um, so that this system can be more useful uh, and require less laboratory uh, in intervention. And so I'll explain a bit first about um, how our CRISPR assay works, and then I'll go a bit more into detail about how it functions in the context of the chip. And so with most systems, of course, the first thing is to collect the biological sample. So in our case, we were working with saliva. Um, I think over the course of the pandemic, there were a lot of people who were using different biological samples. For us, we wanted to make sure that we were not going to be needing any specialized equipment so that this can be useful as an assay within times even when there are um, you know, shortages of material or um, issues with supply chain, which we've all experienced. And so we wanted to avoid things like nasopharyngeal swabs and um, viral transport media. Um, luckily, saliva has a high, um, number of both presence of uh, nucleic acids uh, that we're interested in for the virus as well as antibodies it had both so we chose saliva as the sample and so we were collecting first saliva um, from there we're doing nucleic acid extraction um, for the CRISPR side of things and so the method that we used um, in order to extract was at first we were doing um, just traditional spin kits to validate our assay, and from there we moved on um, and used a proteinase K and heat-based um, inactivation so that we can get nucleic acid extraction um, and nuclease inactivation to make sure that we were getting um, a signal that was directly correlated with the presence uh, of our nucleic acid and not due to things like nucleases in the reaction. Uh, from there, we're doing nucleic acid amplification. So a lot of different Sherlock systems um, build in an amplification method which allows you to more sensitively um, detect the, the nucleic acid of interest. In our case, we were using a lamp-based amplification system, which means that we can very um, specifically select for our target of interest. And it also creates a very rapid production of um, nucleic acid. So it makes our assay faster um, than other traditional amplification assays. From there, um, we add a biochannelated single-stranded DNA. So this is where our assay differs from um, the other Sherlock assays. So in a traditional Sherlock assay, as I was saying before, there's things like a quench fluorescence molecule. In our case, the reporter of the system um, is a single-stranded biotinylated um, DNA. And the way that works is that um, if the um, CRISPR cleaves it, then the uh, biotin is removed from the single-stranded DNA. And if it doesn't, it stays on. Um, and then we use this reaction to flow into the microfluidic chip. Um, and the way that the chip works itself is that on the chip surface, you have um, a complementary piece of PNA, um, which is going to be trying to attract that single-stranded piece of DNA that we're using as the reporter in the system. And so if there's no cleavage that occurs inside of the reaction, which means that the SARS-CoV-2 DNA is not present, then the full uh, single-stranded DNA with the biotin will be recruited onto the PNA that's stopped onto the electrochemical surface which will then recruit the poly HRP and cause the TMB precipitation. So you'll get the signal um, that you would typically get in the presence of an antibody when there's no SARS-CoV-2. Um, and in the case that SARS-CoV-2 is detected, you do not have the presence of the biotin because it's been cleaved from the single-stranded DNA, which means there's no recruitment of the poly HRP and there's no precipitation of the TMB. Um, and so different from the antibody assay, there's actually going to be a signal present when the SARS-CoV-2 is not detected and there will be no signal when the SARS-CoV-2 is detected. Uh, and when we ran these assays, we were really relieved and excited to see that we were able to actually increase the sensitivity um, of our system versus the uh, fluorescence-based um, CRISPR assay that we were using uh, to compare the two systems. And we were able to get down to 800 copies per milliliter or 0.8 copies per microliter um, for our electrochemical assay versus um, the fluorescent assay. So we had about four times more sensitivity for the um, electrochemical assay than for the fluorescent assay. We were also able to have 100% um, accuracy. So when we tested on 30 different patient saliva samples, uh, we were able to fully differentiate between the infected and the non-infected samples, which was really exciting. And so we have this wonderful assay, this CRISPR-based um, 
detection assay for um, nucleic acids, and we have the antibody direct assay for this chip. Um, and we wanted to figure out how do we actually create this into a usable system. So on their own, both of these assays are really wonderful and you can run them on, on in a lab alone, but how do we figure out how to really join the two systems? And so in this case, I collaborated with uh, Mohamed Yafia, which is another member of the Don, of Don Ingber's lab. Um, and we designed a microfluidic chip that would allow us to try and combine all of the preparation needed to do the nucleic acid detection, as well as the direct detection of antibodies using the um, ELISA system. And so we created this really um, exciting, very small chip. So you can see that's the chip next to a quarter. So it's this really, really tiny microfluidic system. It's run by very small, small peristaltic pumps um, to autonomously move fluid throughout the system. And we use um, heat, high heat resistors as the way of providing heating. So it's a very, very low power system. It uses a few volts um, to do the heating for the saliva and um, for the reaction. Uh, and it's super small. We went through a lot of different iterations of um, chips to figure out what was the best method of being able to do the um, extraction and amplification and detection of the system. We wanted to make sure that there would be a minim minimization of evaporation. We wanted to minimize any type of backflow that was happening within the channels. Uh, and we also wanted to make sure that there was enough uh, physical separation between the heating elements and the um, reaction materials such that things weren't getting heated at the wrong time. Um, and things were flowing properly to make sure that um, the order of events would work out. So with a lot of things in biology, you know, the steps of um, the steps really matter, the, the temperature really matters. And so there was a level of precision that was really needed on the microfluidic chip to make sure this would all work out properly, um, especially with a system that integrates LAMP because LAMP is so, so active. Um, you wanted to make sure that there really wasn't going to be any um, interplay between different components at the wrong time such that it might activate the reaction too early um and so that was really a huge benefit of getting to again collaborate with the Ingber lab Mohammed is somebody who was really an expert in microfluidics and so it was a pleasure to get to develop this chip um with him and it was a really great collaborative and iterative process we worked incredibly quickly and every day you know we would just be printing new chips in order to try and test them um and the workflow of the chip is um there's simple preparation region, there's an amplification region, a sensing region, and a readout region. Um, and this is specific to the um, the CRISPR um, assay. So again, the um, antibody assay is just a direct saliva assay. Um, but the CRISPR, the CRISPR RNA detection assay requires a lot of sort of pre-processing that we wanted to make sure we were automating. And so a lot of this work is really just automating that system. Um, and so the way that the chip works, the first region is where you add the saliva. So you add saliva both to the um, sample preparation reservoir for the RNA detection, um, as well as to the um, antibody detection region. And they're separated because the antibody section does not need processing, but the RNA saliva um, will need processing. And so they were going to go through a bit of a different experience. Um, and so the next system, the next step is after adding the proteinase K, um, and having an incubation area, an incubation with a proteinase K, and then a high heat inactivation of that proteinase K, as well as inactivation of any other um, nucleases that might be or in, inhibitors like present in the saliva. We then pump it through um, into the reaction chamber, and the reaction chamber um, actually has this PES filter that's inside of it. So the PES filter is what's actually going to start grabbing on to the nucleic acids that are present within the saliva and make sure that we're concentrating them. So this allows us in that first two steps to um, both inactivate um, and lyse the cells necessary to release the nucleic acid of interest. In our case, this is SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Um, and then flowing it through the reaction chamber allows us to concentrate that RNA, which means that we are working with a saliva sample of about four or 500 microliters. We're able to concentrate all of the RNA present within that larger volume um, so that it can be run for a very small volume lamp amplification. So after concentrating um, this, and that's usually, sorry, using the parasaltic pumps, so pumping the liquid through the reaction chamber, we then move on to the lamp section. So we flow the lamp uh, reagents into the reaction chamber and allow that to incubate. Um, you know, we are overshooting things in the system, so we incubate it for 30 minutes, but usually within 15 minutes, you've already got a really robust signal. Um, again, lamp, if people aren't familiar, uses two to three pairs of primers. 
and it allows for a really sensitive and really rapid amplification of um, the nucleic acid of interest. Um, the beauty of using lamp amplification assay means that we can actually also just run it for RNA and DNA, so it didn't matter much. Um, when you're using other amplification assays, you might have to add um, more um, additives and, and obviously a reverse transcriptase in, those in order to run this reaction. Um, and then moving on after the incubation with the lamp, we flow the CRISPR mix directly into the um, reaction chamber, which means that the lamp assay as well as CRISPR um, reagents and also a bit of water for dilution. So the lamp is so powerful that we actually have to dilute the reaction in order to be able to get um, the type of um, sensitivity that would allow us to get a readable signal. If we just flow the CRISPR directly into the lamp reaction, sometimes it's too much. and everything goes haywire and it just starts slicing everything. So the dilution is really important to make sure that we can get a really sensitive and readable signal within the system. Um, and we you know, had to titrate a lot of that CRISPR um, lamp reaction in order to make sure that it was at the right ratio, um, which would work for our system. Um, as we know, the way that crispr cas works, as I've said before, is that it does the cleavage of the single-stranded DNA. And so the benefit of this is that you are now sensing within the system after amplifying it, whether or not that SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, RNA that you're interested in, whether or not it's actually present within the reaction. And so that is, this step is where actually the cleavage of the single-stranded um, bitinylated DNA is going on. And after you complete that, we flow everything onto the chip. So we can flow saliva onto the chip and we can flow um, the um, CRISPR RNA reaction onto the chip. They all get flown over all of the different um, compartments. So there are four different areas on this eRapid chip that you could have reactions on. So the chip that we've created, which I'll speak about in a minute, um, has the three different um, antibodies of interest as well as the PNA, which is detecting the RNA. Um, and they're all extremely selective for their different um, biomolecules of interest. And so you can flow all of the material over all of the different um, wells and it's completely fine because they will be very selective for what they're um, meant to be grabbing onto. Um, and after you flow the reaction over it, you can then start doing um, flowing the poly HRP and the TMB to get the chip result. And what you'll get is um, electrochemical signals for all of the different, um, uh, all the different probes that you have. And um, you can then be determining whether or not the antibodies in the uh, RNA are present within your sample. Um, and then we did multiplex chips that we were running through the entire system that again, as I was saying, have the spike protein, um, the RBD, the nucleocapsid, and the PNA. And we were able to uh, run about 12 samples that were showing 100% um, correlation with what we were seeing in the samples um, using ELISA's and PCR versus what we were getting from our chip. Um, which was really, I think, a very exciting um, setup because not only is the chip really sensitive and really selective and works very well for these different um, types of molecules, but we were actually also able to run the whole system on the microfluidic chip and have, um, we can keep the sensitivity that we were getting when we were also doing all of the different individual steps. Um, and I think what um, can be great for the future is thinking about how these types of systems these multiplex systems that we can run autonomously and we can run on chips, how we can integrate those both into clinical settings, but also at home settings to figure out how we can develop better, faster, more sensitive and more selective tools that we can use um, in order to detect future pathogens and, and even do environmental monitoring to make sure that we are putting the health and safety of ourselves and our loved ones um, at the forefront. And I think um, there's so many places that we can go with this system, which is so exciting to me. I think it would be great to try and integrate more quantitation into the system. So right now with the amplification that we're using, in this case LAMP, but typically most Sherlock assays um, are not quantitative. They're yes, no, which for things like a pandemic is more than enough. Um, but for um, diseases where you might want more quantitation or semi-quantitation, um, we would need to develop a bit different um, systems in order to make sure that you're getting the sensitivity meeting the sensitivity goal that you want, but also trying to get a quantitative signal. Um, these electrochemical sensors have been shown to be reusable, um, but we haven't, for this specific use case, tried to test the reusability, particularly for the CRISPR assay. So it would be great to try and run future reactions to understand the reusability of these chips um, and the reusability, which would then bring the cost down and increase it, the um, 
accessibility of the system. Um, and also just ways of further automating the system. So right now we have these autonomous chips, but how can create how can we create devices that would allow for you know full automation um, that people can run in their homes, which is more of a product question than anything, but it would be really exciting to see. Um, as well as just developing larger infrastructure for latent monitoring. So a lot of talk has been going on around things like sewage monitoring that's been happening. And I think it would be really exciting to get to use these systems to try and create better latent monitoring frameworks um, for biological monitoring within our environment to understand things like epidemiological signals within um, the you know cities and, and towns and homes that we live within that would be um, ideal. So thank you so much for coming to the talk. I hope that you enjoyed. Um, Please read the paper if you're interested and feel free to reach out.